That was loud. <laughs> Praise God. I was talking to a worship leader one time, another, another worship leader, and she's talking about how when she feels led, God, God, sometimes God will lead her to give out a word, and there was some uh, issue in the, among the leadership of the church as to who was supposed to speak at what time, and she's like, but if I, if I feel led to, to speak, you know, shouldn't I speak? I said, well, it depends. I, you know, I mean, it's, it's if you're going to give a prophetic word in singing and song, because you can. I said, it, it's no different than Paul's instruction is to the church. He said, if, if, if anyone receives a word of prophecy, let him stand by and wait till the others finish speaking, because the spirit of the prophet is subject to him. So uh, I said, uh, really, uh, you know, because people get, pe people think, well, it's a, it's a move of the spirit. The spirit's always moving. He's moving all the time. I said, you just caught a wave is all, you know. It makes me think of at the coast as a, as a kid, you know, we go down every once in a while. I wasn't a huge fan of the beach because, you know, I, I, you know, I burn quick, you know, but um, on those rare occasions that I'd boogie board, you know, in, in the ocean, you got to, you, you, you wait, you have to time it, you know, this, and so the waves, the waves come, you know, and you kind of, kind of kick off the floor and you, and you kind of lean into the wave and you kind of let it just kind of bring you in. But the thing about it is there's always more waves. There's always another wave, you know, and so you're patient and you wait. And, you know, if you miss one, well, you just wait. And, and so I was just telling her, I said, well, you know, the Spirit's always moving. You know, it's not like, you know, if you, if you don't give a word right away, you've missed it or anything. You know, it's like you can, you can hold off and wait. And so it was just some thoughts on worship I had this morning while we were doing that. So anyway. Uh, not like I'm going to join the Olympics or anything, you know. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for your presence. So your presence is always with us, Lord. And as we choose to lean into you, you lean back into us, Lord. That's just how you do things. And so we thank you for your, your heart. And again, I thank you, Lord, that it's, it's you we serve it. Thank you that you are God because you're just so good, Lord, so full of mercy, always eager to turn back from doing harm, eager that people would receive Christ and, and be adopted into your family. And so I, I, I thank you for that. And Lord, I ask that you would uh, help me to give this word, Lord, and um, Help us all to get a hold of it, Lord. And I thank you, Father, and I praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Does anybody have anything before we move on here? I got one of my little crazy things again. Go ahead. Give us the crazy. He loves us so much. So I compare that. How many of you have ever gotten that new puppy? And you see it, and you don't know whether to laugh, Jump, fall down, like, and you love it, and it's just like sleeping. He loves you right back. Doesn't know you. Imagine God loves you more than that. You're the puppy. <laughs> <laughs> It reminds me of a, I, I heard a minister teaching on worship one time, and he said that one of the words translated for worship is not the only one, but one of them, he said it's, it's to, um, to adore affectionately at the way that a dog list, licks its master's hand. You know, and it's like, no, God's not calling us a dog, but it's that kind of love. It's that, you know, I mean, if you ever, you know, if you have a dog, and you know how dogs are, they're just, they're just like, you know, they just, they just want to lick you for no reason. It's just, just to let you know I'm, I'm here for you. You know, I love you. You know, and it's that kind of love toward God that constitutes worship. So, um, oh, I, before I get into this, I, I, Catherine had asked something. She had to go and, you know, if you all want to pray for her, she said she, her, her, one of her horses and donkey went astray, so she's out looking for them today, you know. And so, but she had said that somebody came up to her and asked her about, uh, uh, like, like they were going to be singing someplace, and they asked for her help, and they sent her a, 
uh, email with a song or something like that. So if somebody did that, she, she lost the contact information. So if one of y'all did that, you know, she said that you've got her number, so you can call her. Um, and I'm like, news to me, I don't know. So, so, so anyway. She has a great voice. Well, and... Oh, I see. Okay. All right. I'll talk to her about it. Let her know what you were thinking. Okay. I'll send you the video. Okay. Sure. Sure. Right. I, maybe, yeah, I don't know. Maybe there was more than one. Maybe 10 people talked to her. I don't know. You know, I don't know. Okay. Okay, great. I'll, I'll let her know. So I wanted to do that before I forgot. So, okay. The title of today's message is, Are You Covered? And, uh, you know, I admit I, I laughed a little bit while I was typing that out because it sounds like clickbait, you know, like... You know, are you, co- are, are you covered? Are you covered? You know, and, but no, we're not talking about your car's warranty or anything like that, you know. But this is one of those, you know, the story that we're looking at today is one of those that really hit me as one of those things that God has put in place right under our nose that we don't really think about, you know. Um, and uh, just to let you guys, the, the, I mean, I just, got, I just got Samuel and Timothy with me in here, but I do have stuff for you guys if you... If you listen to that. All right, so why are there some people that just kind of seem to get away with living wrong? You know, they refuse to do God's way of doing things, you know, and yet they seem to prosper. And none of, we're all, none of us, I know, are where we want to be. We should always be looking to get closer to God. So this is not a condemnation on anybody, but this is, this is really... I'm not looking for us to necessarily look inward with this question. It's more like looking out. Because if you've ever, if you've ever seen this uh, phenomenon, you know, where it's like this guy, this guy, this girl, they always just seem to get away with doing things or they just kind of seem like they prosper, they're okay. Well, why? Why? You know, they, you know, uh, maybe another way to look at it, you know, growing up as a kid, did you ever notice some other kids that just always seem to get away with stuff and... You know, one of my teachers said, he said, I was one of those good kids that never got a spanking. He said, you know, because this was, you know, he's, he's older, you know, he said, I never, he, he said, but my brother, he said, he might as well just keep his pants down because he, you know, so he, he, he didn't get away with stuff, but, you know, uh, I'm, t- you know, and then like, uh, you, after you grow up, you know, you see, you're working with somebody, I mean, how many of us have had that coworker that they just show up late, they break the rules, it just kind of seems like they're, you know, they, it's like, how are you? Getting away with this, and if you're that coworker, don't, don't, uh, don't mind me, you know. But so it's like, but if you're not, then you're like, if I ever did that, I would get fired right away, you know. I just know I would, probably because you know better, you know. The, the ones who know better, you know, got to hold them more accountable. Uh, so let's uh, turn over to the book of Proverbs. Just kind of want to look at a spiritual principle that a lot of us miss. And really, when you look at it from the other side, you can see really how much God has entrusted us with. It just staggers my mind, you know. So Proverbs chapter 10, did I say that? Okay, the paperwork, which which verse is is it saying? Oh, well, that's later. Proverbs 10, 12. I got this crackling thing. I'm going to have to replace this microphone. Okay, so Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12. It says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. In 1 Peter 4, the word says that love covers a multitude of sins. And I used to wonder about what that meant. Like, what does that mean? You know, what does it mean for me, for you, that love covers a multitude of sins? And uh, while I probably don't understand the true depth of what God means by that, I can give you some, uh, maybe a framework to go on here, just kind of like some surface level understanding. First of all, a covering is not forgiveness. That means my love cannot forgive another person's sins. Just like their love can't forgive mine. You know, people, you know, we get our sins forgiven by accepting Jesus as our Lord, Savior, you know. And then by confessing our sins to God when we mess up from time to time, because we do, 
you know, you can read about that in First John 1. You know, he says, uh, he, he, says uh, I'm telling, he said, I'm writing these things to you so that you don't sin. He said, but if you do sin, you've got, a, you've got an advocate before the Father, it's Jesus. So you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us your sins, you know. Because he wants to keep us in the kingdom. So then, you know, what good is it for a person to have their sins covered by the love of another? Well, we know in this context that it's not talking about the love of God. It's talking about our love for one another. That covers a multitude of sins. And, well, how do we know that it's not talking about God's love? Well, because God's love is more powerful than that. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When people respond to God's love by accepting Jesus, he cleanses all their sins. Some Christians say that the blood of Jesus covers sins, but, but no. No. The word says his blood cleanses our sins. And people say, well, what's the difference? Well, cleansing is better than a covering. Far better. You can remove a covering. If I have a shirt that's got a huge grass stain on it and I'm trying to hide it from my wife, no, I don't do that. But say, you know, and so I throw it on the bed and you, and you throw a blanket over it, you know. Well, now it's covered, right? It's covered, so you, you can't see it. But see, the stain can be seen again as soon as that blanket is removed. But if I cleanse that stain so it's gone, and that, that, that stain then will always be gone. It cannot be, you know, a cleansing cannot be removed. It's something that remains forever. You know, you may get a new stain on the shirt, but, but that first stain is gone forever. And that's what the blood of Jesus does for us. Cleanses your sins. And then your sins are gone forever. As far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your sins from you. The handwriting that's been written against you has been blotted out. God, why did that, why did that stuff out? But now, God would not have given us this verse in Proverbs and the other one like it in 1 Peter if they did not have some value for us to understand. Because you can't cleanse anybody's sins, but you can walk in love toward them. So, let's get into the story for today, and we'll digest these things a bit more. Let's turn uh, in the Bible back over to 1 Samuel, like I was mentioned, 1 Samuel chapter 7. How are you all today? You all excited? Eager to learn. Eager to learn. Yeah. Uh, don't worry, I won't do that thing where people are like, are you excited? I can't stand it when they do that at rallies. Okay. Maybe I've got a hard heart toward that. I don't know. Anyway, we're going to do this a little differently than we've done in the past. because I don't want, And I don't want you to get too weary with too much history um, and too much reading, but... I need to give some history here in order to understand this idea of love covering a multitude of sins what is that, and what that means for us. So here in 1 Samuel 7, God, God's people had turned away from him and they're worshiping other gods. And this happened many times throughout the Old Testament. So as a result of that, God had allowed the Philistines to come in and take over. And uh, they had problems with the Philistines for a long time. Many years, these enemies, the Philistines, they, they would come in and cause problems for the Israelites. But there was this priest and prophet named Samuel that was praying for the people and trying to get them to turn back to God. We need people like that. So we're in chapter 7. Look down at verse 3 with me. It says, Then Samuel said to all the people of Israel, If you are really serious about wanting to return to the Lord, get rid of your foreign gods and your images of Ashtoreth, Determine to obey only the Lord, then he will rescue you from and Ashtoreth and worshiped only the Lord. Then Samuel told them, gather all of Israel to Mizpah and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah and in a great ceremony drew water from a well and poured it out before the Lord. That's a drink offering there. Uh, they also went without food all day and confessed that they had sinned against the Lord. It was at Mizpah that Samuel became Israel's judge. When the Philistine rulers heard that Israel had gathered at Mizpah, they mobilized their army and advanced. They didn't like this. 
So they're, you know, if, yeah, how many, you know, you, you try to, you, you turn around, you want to do something for God, you want to live for God, and all of a sudden there's a challenge, right? So here's the challenge. Uh, so they mobilized their army in advance. The Israelites were badly frightened when they learned that the Philistines were approaching. Don't stop pleading with the Lord our God to save us from the Philistines, they begged Samuel. So Samuel took a young lamb and offered it to the Lord as a whole burnt offering. He pleaded with the Lord to help Israel, and the Lord answered him. Just as Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines arrived to attack Israel. But the Lord spoke with a mighty voice of thunder from heaven that day, and the Philistines were thrown into such confusion that the Israelites defeated them. The men of Israel chased them from Mizpah to a place below beth slaughtering them all along the way. Samuel then took a large stone and placed it between the towns of Mizpah and Jeshanah. He named it Ebenezer, which means the stone of help. For he said, up to this point, the Lord has helped us. So like I said, the Philistines had beaten Israel for many years, beaten them bad. And uh, this is the turning of the tide here. Uh, when they, they return to God, they turn their hearts to God. So then, you know, if you're in trouble in life, turn to God. He'll help you. But make sure you stay with him. You know, how, how, how sad it is to get God's help and then abandon him. You know. So, all right, verse 12 again. We'll read that again. Samuel then took a large stone and placed it between the towns of Mizpah and Jeshanah. He named it Ebenezer, which means the stone of help. For he said, up to this point, the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and didn't invade Israel again for some time. And throughout Samuel's lifetime, the Lord's powerful hand was raised against the Philistines. Okay, this is what I wanted you to see. That last line right there. Throughout Samuel's lifetime, the Lord's powerful hand was raised against the Philistines. So if you have a pen with you, underline that phrase. Okay? From this point, during Samuel's lifetime, his whole life, he, he was guaranteed that God would help him against the Philistines. Now, is it because God just decided to do that? Just because, oh, I've just decided to favor Samuel. Or was it because Samuel was completely devoted to God throughout his life? And he was. He was. I mean, he made his mistakes. He wasn't perfect, you know. And we, we won't talk about that today, but he did. But see, God rewards that kind of devotion. Now, the story doesn't end here. Next chapter in verse 8, or I mean, not verse 8. Next chapter in verse 1, chapter 8. It says, as Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. Joel and Abijah, his oldest sons, held court in Beersheba, but they were not like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes and perverted justice. Finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah, or Ra, 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 whatever, Ramah, I guess it is, to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old. I love that. They walk in and tell Samuel, look, you're old. Ha. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I was laughing about that yesterday. I'm like, that's funny. Make myself laugh. Anyway, so they said, look, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. That's wise. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for it is me they are rejecting, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they are giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. All right, so the story's developing a bit here. Now the people want a king. And uh, Samuel did warn them about... Let's skip ahead because we've got quite a bit of reading here in uh, the, the beginning part of chapter 9. So let's, uh, and this is just kind of to, I think it helps us to, to kind of get a picture of the way that they lived and put, put ourselves, you know, um, in the picture here and, and you know, kind of seek to understand the people. So in, in the chapter 9, verse 1, it says, There was a wealthy, influential man named Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. He was the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Becherath, son of Aphiah, of the tribe of Benjamin. His son Saul was the most handsome man in Israel, head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. One day, Kish's donkeys strayed away, and he told Saul, take a servant with you and go look for the donkeys. 
So Saul took one of the servants and traveled through the hill country of Ephraim, the land of Shalishah, the Shalim area, and the entire land of Benjamin, but they couldn't find the donkeys anywhere. Finally, they entered the region of Zuf, and Saul said to his servant, let's go home. By now, my father will be more worried about us than about the donkeys. But the servant said, I've just thought of something. There is a man of God who lives here in this town. He is held in high honor by all the people because everything he says comes true. Let's go find him. Perhaps he can tell us which way to go. But we don't have anything to offer him, Saul replied. Even our food is gone, and we don't have a thing to give him. Well, the servant said, I have one small silver piece. We can at least offer it to the man of God and see what happens. Now, I, I love this exchange here because it's like these two young guys are like, we don't have no idea what we're doing out here. You know, it's just kind of messing around out in the countryside like, I don't know what to do. You know what to do? I don't know. Let's try it. Let's try this thing. Let's see, you know. Um, you know, so verse 9, it says, In those days, if people wanted a message from God, they would say, let's go and ask the seer, for prophets used to be called seers. All right, Saul agreed. Let's try it. So they started into the town where the man of God lived. Now, of course, the man of God is Samuel. And well, you know, so we, <laughs> not you, the the biblical Samuel. Okay, so here, uh, where was I? Okay, so it says, as, uh, verse 11 says, as they were climbing the hill to the town, they met some young women coming out to draw water. So Saul and his servant asked, is the seer here today? Yes, they replied, stay right on this road. He is at the town gates. He has just arrived to take part in a public sacrifice up at the place of worship. Hurry and catch him before he goes up there to eat. The guests won't begin eating until he arrives to bless the food. So they entered the town, and as they passed through the gates, Samuel was coming out toward them to go up to the place of worship. Now here is what we call a divine appointment. God has already set this up that they're going to meet with one another here. Now the Lord had told Samuel the previous day, this is verse 15, uh, 15 into 16, about this time tomorrow I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him to be the leader of my people Israel. He will rescue them from the Philistines, for I have looked down on my people in mercy and have heard their cry. Now, just a word here about divine appointments. So, now, isn't it interesting? There, there's, no, there's been no indication between the servant and Saul that they have any idea that God has set this up, right? But God just told Samuel, I will send you a man from the tribe of Benjamin. And so, God is directing Saul's steps in the background in a way that Saul doesn't realize that God is the one orchestrating this thing. Okay, so just keep that in mind when God puts somebody in your path because a lot of times it's like they, they have no idea. They're not expecting it, you know. Okay, it's this exact kind of situation that you could have here. But look down at, at verse, uh, wait, no. Where did, I get, where did I get off to? 17, thank you. So verse 17, it says, When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said, That's the man I told you about. He will rule my people. Just then Saul approached Samuel at the gateway and asked, can you please tell me where the seer's house is? I am the seer, Samuel replied. Go up to the place of worship ahead of me. We will eat there together, and in the morning I'll tell you what you want to know and send you on your way. And don't worry about those donkeys that were lost three days ago, for they have been found. And I am here to tell you that you and your family are the focus of all Israel's hopes. Uh, Saul's not expecting that. <laughs> Verse 21, Saul replied, but I'm only from the tribe of Benjamin the smallest tribe in Israel, and my family is the least important of all the families of that tribe. Why are you talking like this to me? Then Samuel brought Saul and his servant into the hall and placed them at the head of the table, honoring them above the 30 special guests. Samuel then instructed the cook to bring Saul the finest cut of meat, the piece that had been set aside for the guest of honor. So the cook brought in the meat and placed it before Saul. Go ahead and eat it, Samuel said. I was saving it for you even before I invited these others. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. When they came down from the place of worship and returned to town, Samuel took Saul up to the roof of the house and prepared a bed for him there. At daybreak the next morning, Samuel called to Saul, Get up, it's time you are on your way. So Saul got ready, and he and Samuel left the house together. When they reached the edge of town, Samuel told Saul to send his servant on ahead. After the servant was gone, Samuel said, Stay here, for I have received a special message for you from God. Okay, next beginning of the next chapter. Then Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it over Saul's head. He kissed Saul and said, I am doing this because the Lord has appointed you to be the ruler over Israel, his special possession. So Samuel puts Saul in this place of honor at the, at the sacrificial meal. Then he anoints him, kisses his cheek, and he tells him, you're going to be king. How'd you like to live a day like that? 
But there are responsibilities to being a king. Samuel tells Saul about some things he's going to encounter when, he, when he's getting ready to leave, and then he gives him some very important instructions. So look down at verse 7. So this is Samuel still talking to Saul. He says, After these things take place, do what must be done, for God is with you. Now, does that mean then that Saul has been equipped with everything he needs to do everything that God has called him to do? Yes. And he said, God is with you. Verse 8, then go down to Gilgal ahead of me. I will join you there to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. You must wait for seven days until I arrive and give you further instructions. So now uh, Samuel is letting him know, uh, kind of through omission, that your responsibility as the king is to deliver the people. My responsibility as the priest is to offer the sacrifices. So these offices don't tread on one another. Okay. So he's letting him know, giving him some clear-cut instructions here. Okay, now, now, I was that kid that the teachers, you know, in class, the teacher's telling me, remember what I'm telling you, this is very important, this will be on the test, but as I'm saying, or as they're saying that, I'm thinking, okay, I know that this is important, but what was it that she said? <laughs> because I have no idea, you know. Now, I don't think that that happened with Saul, but, I mean, thank God I wasn't in Saul's position that day. So Samuel gives Saul these very important instructions, very specific. And, and, and it's because, and I believe that the reason it's so specific is because before, it's a, there's some stuff that happens before Saul ever gets to Gilgal, a bunch of stuff that happens in, in uh, the rest of chapter 10, chapter 11, and chapter 12. And some stuff makes the Philistines angry, so they muster this army, and they show, they, they show up, you know, so they're going to attack. So now look uh, over in chapter 13, down at verse 5. It says, The Philistines mustered a mighty army of 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and as many warriors as the grains of sand on the seashore. That's like a general term that the Bible uses to say there were so many that they didn't bother to, t- to count. They couldn't number it. It was just too many. It's kind of like, in the, you know, uh, back with Joseph and the, the grain stores, you know, he'd, he was saving up grain, and it says eventually he stopped tabulating, just stopped keeping count because there was too much grain to count. That he's like, just forget it, just store it all in the barns because we can't, there's just so much. And that's saying something because he was a talented administrator. So it's like, that's a lot of, that's a lot of crops. And it's the same kind of thing here. There's so many uh, warriors that it's like this, uh, just this vast host that you can't, it's like, there's so many, I, I don't see the end of it. It says, they camped at Michmash, east of beth Aven. The men of Israel saw what a tight spot they were in, and because they were hard-pressed by the enemy, they tried to hide in caves, thickets, rocks, holes, and cisterns. Some of them crossed the, jo- the Jordan River and escaped into the land of Gad and Gilead. Meanwhile, Saul stayed at Gilgal, and his men were trembling with fear. So there's this uh, instruction, go to Gilgal, wait for Samuel. Okay, so he's at Gilgal, so he followed step one. Saul waited there seven days for Samuel, as Samuel had instructed him earlier, but Samuel still didn't come. Saul realized that his troops were rapidly slipping away, so he demanded, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Saul sacrificed the burnt offering himself. Just as Saul was finishing with the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. Saul went out to meet him and welcome him, but Samuel said, what is this you have done? Saul replied, I saw my men scattering from me, and you didn't arrive when you said you would, and the Philistines are at Michmash ready for battle. So I said, the Philistines are ready to march against us at Gilgal, and I haven't even asked for the Lord's help. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering myself before you came. So he still expected him to get there, right? (laughs) But this is, you know, this is justification, right? Well, I I mean, I I thought, well, I haven't even asked for God's help, so I... But see, the word said there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is destruction. Verse 13, how foolish, Samuel exclaimed, you have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. So sadly, King Saul failed his test. And after this, he, he messed up a couple more times. He did a couple of things that was like, why are you, what are you doing? 
Now, Samuel had, had told before before uh, Saul was you know, actually gathered his army at Gilgal and everything, Samuel had told the people that he was never going to stop praying for them and telling them, teaching them to do what was right. He told them, I will always do this. I will always pray for you. I will always tell you to do what's right. So, and, and, and keep in mind that Saul was included in that assembly. Paul's part of that promise. Samuel's like, I'm, I'm, I'm praying for the nation, but I'm, I'm also praying for Saul. I mean, Samuel, Samuel loved Saul. Like a, like a son. I mean, it's what it looks like to me. So flip to the end of chapter 15 with me. And look down at verse 34. It says, Then Samuel went home to Ramah, and Saul returned to his house at Gibeah of Saul. Samuel never went to meet with Saul again, but he mourned constantly for him. And the Lord was sorry he had ever made Saul king of Israel. Now the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. So uh, if you remember uh, David from the story of David and Goliath, David is the next king that God has selected. He's the one who he goes to, Samuel goes to anoint now after God gives him that. And if you remember the story, when David volunteered to fight Goliath, King Saul tried to put his armor on David. You know, it's the same Saul that we just read about here. Saul's intentions were always good, but he was always trying to do things his own way. We'll do it my way. And we'll see more of that as we go on. But you remember that it was still a long time before David became king. Long time. And Saul got more and more jealous of David. You know, David served under him, was a very successful army commander. You know, and, and the, the more successful he was because he was just honoring his king, honoring God. You know, with that, with that heart that God said, the heart that's after my own heart. You know, so, so Saul just became more and more jealous of him because the more successful David was, the more the people loved him. And that's favor from God because he, David's living to honor God. David's doing, doing things God's way. So God, so God honors David with favor. And because of that, Saul begins to mistrust David and he becomes very jealous of David and he sees him as a threat. So he wants him dead. And, uh, in fact, I counted one time, and David hid from Saul in over 20 places around the countryside because Saul was constantly trying to kill him. And, I mean, you know, we think about, like, uh, you know, you see fugitive movies nowadays where someone's hiding from whatever, and it's like they may, hide, they may hide two or three places in the course of the movie. David hid over 20 places from Saul. It's like, this guy is really after me, you know. Really, God was pr protecting David, Really. And he was giving Saul so many chances, God was. See, because God, did, he rejected Saul from being king, but he didn't reject him as one of his people. He was still one of God's people. God just removed him from that office. It's like, you're still one of my people. Just, you're just not king anymore because you wouldn't, you wouldn't follow instructions. So uh, I would wonder, you know, how could Saul make... So many bad decisions, you know, by trying to hunt down David all the time. And yet at the same time, though, when he, whenever he got word that the Philistines were invading, he would turn back from chasing David and go protect the land. And, and he would be successful in his battles against the Philistines while he was protecting the land. Okay? And, and I mean, it goes back to that kid at school who's always doing bad stuff and not getting caught, but, you know, or the, or the co-worker that's like not, you know, not doing their best work, but they're doing some work, you know. And I thought, well, you know, Saul seems to have mixed success at being king. He doesn't seem to be the worst king that they ever had. He's the first king, but, you know, like, he doesn't seem to be the worst. And I'm like, you know, he protects the Philistines. I mean, he protects the people from the Philistines, at least, you know. And I thought, well, why did God help Saul defeat the Philistines after he clearly said that he had rejected Saul from being king? And so I'm, I'm pondering this, and I'm praying about it, you know. And it, it, because as far as God was concerned, David was already king. And David could have, I mean, a lot of people say, well, David needed to go through that time for training. Well, yeah, sure, he certainly benefited from that training, but he could have served as, as king as soon as Samuel anointed him, and he would have been okay. I mean, there were younger kings that did just fine. So, so yes, I mean, it, it's, it's probably good that he went through that training time. It would have benefited him, but I would wonder about this, because it's like, 
seems like God's already anointed David. So why is Saul having any kind of success whatsoever? And uh, God showed me why. And when I saw it, I thought my heart would break. For this man. Saul made one more mistake before he died in battle. Stay here with me in 1 Samuel and turn ahead to chapter 28. I'll skip ahead quite a ways here. Don't worry, we're going somewhere with this. Chapter 28, look down at verse 3 with me. It says, meanwhile, Samuel had died. Okay, so Samuel was old, we already knew that. Samuel had um, anointed Saul king. Saul failed, he anointed David king, and now he's passed away. So Samuel had died, and all Israel had mourned for him. He was buried in Ramah, his hometown. And Saul had banned from the land of Israel all mediums and those who consult the spirits of the dead. So all the fortune tellers and the people who you know, practice astrology, all that, because that was, that was around back then, people who consult the spirits of the dead, they'd been put out of the land. Because that's uh, all witchcraft, and God hates witchcraft. You know, it's one of the things that Saul did that was right, anyway. And in order to understand why God hates witchcraft, we would need to understand what witchcraft does. When we pray, we pray, we ask God for something, for him to do something for us supernaturally. Anything we receive from God does not come by natural means. Even if, some, even if you know, someone asks God, hey, you know, uh, Work's been slow. I, I, can't, I can't make my rent this month. Will you help me? And if someone shows up out of the blue and gives them a check, for, you know, a rent check, sure, that's a physical check, but God told that person to pay the rent. You know, so that's a, that's a supernatural provision. E, or even if God had led their boss to give them an extra shift that week or something so that they could pay their rent, that's still a supernatural provision because God intervened. Amen? So... Here is a definition of witchcraft for you, a, de a definition of it. Witchcraft is anything that seeks a supernatural result by going around God to get it. That is witchcraft. And it comes in all shapes and sizes, you know. And there's probably a lot of things out there that, that people in, you know, in traditionalism will, will label as witchcraft, but it's not really because you ha because the, the it's like is are they looking to accomplish some kind of spiritual thing? I mean, should should we just write out a list of things and say this is all witchcraft and everything else is fine? No, we need to be discerning about everything. So if it's a supernatural thing that people are seeking and they're not asking God for it, it's witchcraft. And we're not talking about physical things. I mean, you know, we're not talking about working out or something like that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a supernatural thing. Some kind of uh, uh, power, knowledge, you know, they sh people shouldn't have, uh, something like that that, that is, su is supernatural in nature, spiritual in nature, that is not from God. Okay? But the reason, but, but why, why am I talking about this? Because... God hates witchcraft because it replaces him. It replaces him. Because if, so, if I'm pursuing that, I'm trying to get supernatural results by going around God. I'm no longer seeking God. I've pushed God out of my life in order to go after this thing, whatever it is. This is why God hates it, because it destroys relationship with him. I'm sorry. Playing the lie was not supernatural. No, that's not a. That's a. That's a. You're, that's. <laughs> not that I do it, but no, no, no. I'm talking about a supernatural thing, some kind of, some kind of, you know. I mean, anything that you that that can't be achieved through natural means. That's what I'm talking about. So if you can you if you can achieve it by going to college, getting an education, go to go. I mean, that's not that's not what I'm talking about here. Okay. So, when Saul, see, and, and the reason is because God wants to be our provider of, of spiritual things, okay? So, when Saul did the sacrifice without Samuel, that wasn't witchcraft, because the sacrifice was still to God. You understand that? 
All he did there was step out of his office. That was just disobedience. He was still looking to God. He was just, he'd stepped into another person's office, which he had no business doing. It would have been like Samuel trying to lead the troops into battle. Samuel wasn't the king. Okay. So what happened was that Saul just kept overriding what God was telling him. God's telling him, do this. And Saul would do it his way. Or he would do part of it and not do it all. And so what he was doing then, he's overriding what God was telling him to do in favor of what he wanted to do. And so uh, it, it just kept happening to the point where eventually he, goes to, he gets involved with this fortune teller here in chapter 28. So look at verse 4. It says, The Philistines set up their camp at Shunem, and Saul gathered all the army of Israel and camped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the vast Philistine army, he became frantic with fear. Fear can lead people to wrong decisions, bad decisions. He asked the Lord what he should do, but the Lord refused to answer him, either by dreams or by sacred lots or by the prophets. Why? Because he's not king. <laughs> he's got no business asking this. Verse 7, Saul then said to his advisors, find a woman who is a medium so I can go and ask her what to do. His advisors replied, there is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself by wearing ordinary clothing instead of his royal robes. Then he went to the woman's house at night, accompanied by, by two of his men. Now, doesn't that just tell you that he's, he, he's disguising himself, he's going by night? Doesn't that mean he knows this is wrong? Okay. So we don't want to get into all that with their exchange that they talk about because I don't want to, ch I don't want to change our focus to talking about witchcraft. That's not what my focus is. The long, but my, the long story is the short here is that this is the last mistake that Saul makes before he falls in battle to the Philistines. And again, I thought, well, up until now, Saul has had success in fighting with the Philistines. Why did he lose this battle and die? And then I saw it. The Lord showed me. This battle was fought right after Samuel died. Turn back all those pages to where you underlined that last part of that verse back there in chapter 7. And this is what we've, all, we've been getting to at this point. Look at that last line there in chapter 13, or verse 13, excuse me. It says, and throughout Samuel's lifetime, the Lord's powerful hand was raised against the Philistines. Samuel's lifetime. Not Saul's. Why did it look like Saul had some success? Even though he was always doing things his way? It was because of Samuel's life. So the kid who gets away with things that he shouldn't, the co-worker that should get fired but they don't, who's praying for them? What person that we don't see that is in their life is praying for them? Or you could say, who are they, why, who, what person in their life is extending this blessing that's upon their life just by being there, just by being faithful. Hmm. Remember, Samuel told the people, as long as I live, I won't stop praying for you. He mourned for Saul. The Bible tells us love covers a multitude of sins. How many of us had mothers, fathers, friends praying for us before we got saved? How many times should we have died but narrowly escaped somehow? Now think about the people that you're praying for. And don't get weary. Because love covers a multitude of sins. You intercede for people, and now they have more time to make a decision for Jesus. All the mistakes and the battles that Saul should have lost to the Philistines, he survived because of the faithfulness of Samuel. Because God's hand was against the Philistines all of Samuel's days. That promise died with Samuel. 
because Saul refused to do things God's way. Remember, Samuel told Saul, if you had just obeyed God's instructions, he would have established your kingdom forever. See, then Saul could have had that, the same benefits that Samuel had. The, God's hand would have been against the Philistines all the days of Saul's life. And, but so, because he refused to do things God's way, he had to settle for the blessing that God had put upon Samuel. Do you see it? And he probably didn't understand that blessing on Samuel was the reason that he survived all those battles. Because there are a lot of people out there who are just kind of half-heartedly living for God. Well, you know, I said the sinner's prayer and just kind of just do my own thing now, you know. Or the person that says, oh, there's plenty of time to come to Jesus. You know, and, and maybe nothing really bad seems to happen to them for a while, so they think they're okay. But they don't see, they don't understand that there is some person in their life who is faithfully praying for them. And, and so because of that, they are under God's protection for the sake of the faithful one. <laughs> because love covers a multitude of sins. It's like the consequences are temporarily suspended. Like... But you notice that as soon as Samuel died and his prayers stopped, that covering was removed, just like that blanket pulled off of that shirt to reveal that stain now. And so you see the grace God has extended to people. He gives people time to repent and come to Jesus, and he chooses to operate through the prayers of his people. This is why Paul said to pray for all men everywhere. I desire that you pray for all men everywhere. Pray for leaders, all who are in authority. Because through that prayer, God will preserve their life until they come to a point where they accept Christ. If they don't come to a point where they accept Christ, they can't say they didn't have plenty of chances. So I'm telling you that your prayers do more than you know. And now the purpose of this was not to put anyone in fear. You know, of, uh-oh, someone stops praying for me, I'm in trouble. No, no, no. Live to please God. Seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added to you. The protection that you need, the provision that you need. Amen? So the purpose of this, you know, I wanted to put some things into perspective. First, I wanted us to understand why sometimes it looks like the wicked people in the world seem to prosper. Because who is praying for them? Next, I want us to understand why it can look like people who only make a partial commitment to God. It seems like they're okay for a while. And then I wanted to show how God can use people in our lives that we don't even think about to bless us and give us the time that we need to get back into God's will, to get back into step with Him. Amen? Okay, so was this helpful? <laughs> okay, praise God. Lord, help us apply it. All right, guys. Good, I'm glad. I'm glad it was encouraging. Last, don't stop praying. The last thing that you want is, is to give someone, you know, try to encourage them and then have them go, oh my gosh, that's so depressing. Why is it depressing? Just trust God. All right, you guys, I've just got two boys with me today. How many questions should I ask them? <laughs> Twelve apiece. <laughs> I don't know. Three each? Okay. I have an offer on the table. Three each. How about I do two each and save some of the candy for the other kids, huh? I'll do that. All right. True or false? You ready? You ready? True or false? <laughs> I could open up to the adults, I guess. All right. So, true or false? Because Samuel was faithful, God's hand was against the Philistines all the days of his life. Sorry, Timothy, Samuel was a little quicker on that one. True, True all right. <laughs> Reese's. Yeah, Reese's are worth cheering about. That's true. I ended up somehow with some, some uh, Reese's pieces in there, and Samuel goes, now all the other children will know 
how good Reese's Pieces are. It's like, okay. It's a declaration of faith, right? All right, true or false? Because God would not, or excuse me, because Saul would not obey God, God rejected him from being king. Timothy, true, he's got it. They've been paying attention. Maybe I'll skip ahead and see if I can find some more difficult question. No, it's okay, I'll just, because we've got them up on here. Yeah, one-to-one. It's not a competition. All right, true or false? When Jesus forgives us, he cleanses our sins, much like when you remove a stain from clothes. It's like it was never there. True or false? Well, Sammy's only one raising his hand, so he's like, hold on. True. Do you remember those Got Milk commercials? That first one with the radio question where the, the answer is Aaron Burr and the guy's got peanut butter in his mouth and there's no milk. And he's like, Aaron Burr. And they're like, we can't understand you. And he's like, Aaron Burr. I found that on YouTube the other day and showed the kids. I'm like, you guys got to see this. All right, true or false? Timothy, true or false? Love covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> true. He goes, this is important. It's going to be on the test. Okay, that's all. Then I'll just save the rest of the candy for the other kids. How about that? Unless you adults, do you guys want to answer questions? I've got, I've got eight more questions here. <laughs> you guys crack me up. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's extend it to you guys. I've always wanted to be able to make, let the, have the adults do it. Okay. <laughs> All right, adults, we're getting to the harder ones. True or false? Okay, Michael, you're going to have to be my judge here and see who has the, who's quickest on the draw. Yeah, now, now, now I'm, in, I'm putting you to work. What happened? Okay, it's still the crack. True or false? When we pray for people who are doing wrong, it is showing them love. That was Sarah. She got it. Come on down. You can, yeah, you can get a candy, yeah. The kids took all the good ones, though, so. <laughs> yeah, the white chocolate ones. I was like, oh, there's white chocolate today. Tammy's the one that picks the candy, so you can thank her for later. All right. So we won't, let's not do any repeats because i got lots of adults here. True or false? Number six. Because of those who pray, God will protect those they pray for to give them time to repent and come to Jesus. That was Jonathan. He, true, he's got it. Who said no? All right. True or false? Throughout his whole lifetime, Samuel prayed for the people and taught them to do what is right. Virginia? True. She's got it. It's a pattern. Have you noticed a pattern, Charlie? <laughs> I'll talk about that in a second. It's funny because it, cause it, uh, at Rayma, one of our tests, it was a true or false. I mean, it was like 50 questions, and they were all true or false. And every single one of them was false. And I get down, I'm like, I'm like 37 questions in, and I'm like, why are they all false? But I'm like, well, okay. So I, just, I, I marked them all false, and some people were mad because they got some marked wrong. And so they brought it up with Pastor. He was up behind the, the podium, and they said, they said, hey, some of these, they're like, you tricked us. He's like, if the answer is false, it's false. He's like, I wasn't trying to trick you. He's like, there are, it just so happens all the answers are false. I do have a false one in here, by the way. <laughs> True or false? It was not that Samuel was especially good or that Saul was especially bad. They could both choose to do things God's way. True or False. You've already gone, Samuel. I don't see a hand. Should I just answer that one and take a candy for myself? Iris? You got it, true. She's like, sounds good. <laughs> sounds true. True or false? The people, the people told Samuel they wanted a king only because Samuel was super old. <laughs> I heard Josh say it. It's false. You got it. Now, I think about this. The people, they wanted to do things their own way, too, didn't they? They said, give us a king to judge us like the other nations have. We want to be like them. All right, last one. True or false? The only reason Saul was able to defeat the Philistines was because of Samuel's faithfulness to God. Eric? True. 
True, he's got it. All right. Help yourself to some sugar. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, and we thank you that your faithfulness inspires us to be faithful. And yeah, we may mess up, but we will get up again and strive to be faithful to that upward call of Jesus. So then we ask, Lord, that as, as uh, we go out, I ask you to protect everyone, give them the provision that they need, give them the healing that they need, and set people in their path and, uh, for that divine appointment, Lord, and give them the words to speak or a gift of healing or whatever it may be. Let those spiritual gifts be in operation, please, Lord. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You're all dismissed. <laughs>